Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, we are uh, starting the webinar now. Uh, it's been a few minutes. We were waiting for uh, the rest of the audience. Uh, so the rest of the people will join us in a couple of minutes. Uh, we won't be, be waiting for them. Uh, let's, uh, let's begin our webinar. I'm excited uh, that today we are discussing a very hot topic, in my opinion, about alternative uh, financing options for startups. It's uh, been very um, um, untouched, I mean, not a deeply, not deeply analyzed by lots of startups, and they are all looking for venture funding or venture investors. But what are other options for startups you may, you may find on the market to uh, accelerate your growth, uh, uh, the growth of your business? And um, today uh, we have a great speaker, Kate Cohen, who is uh, a managing partner at 13 Ventures. Uh, she's a very experienced uh, venture investor and uh, uh, entrepreneur. She uh, uh, knows uh, deeply uh, venture tech the venture investment industry but not only she has a lot of expertise in alternative capital options for startups and for that reason actually uh, i invited kate to speak with you uh, on this topic and i encourage everyone to prepare questions in advance and here in uh, the sections below we have q a section please write your questions in there we will pick every question one by one or the best ones, and we'll ask Kate to answer those questions. If you would like to network or communicate in, in the chat, just feel free to use our chat for any other communications, but your questions will be in Q&A section. If you would like to ask your questions uh, verbally, uh, we can give you this chance. I can uh, like allow to speak, but you just need to raise your hand in the system. And, uh, uh, you'll be able to speak. All the questions will go after uh, the, uh, the webinar. So please be patient and uh, we will answer all of your questions. I have a few slides to share with you. One moment, a few announcements to do. Um, so uh, today's topic, as I mentioned, alternative capital options for startups. And um, this topic is uh, an important topic for global startups who are trying to raise uh, capital and uh, venture funding is not always available for everybody, right? Uh, in fact, just very small percentage of startups around the world uh, are being financed, financed by uh, uh, angel investors or venture capital investors. So definitely not everybody gonna get it, right? Um, this event is under Go Global World community and those who uh, just first time on our community, I'll, I'll remind our mission and uh, the reason we exist and what's your role in here. So this is a free community for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs who speak English and would like to go global. It's a uh, free community, but uh, we have expectations from you guys. Uh, you need to be active on the community chats and proactively help each other not waiting for anybody just to ask you directly. So if you see a question, act and help. This is uh, how we um, uh, build our global network, our reputation uh, in front of each other. And of course, help each other to access different markets. Um, this is our team uh, around the world. Uh, we have about 40 people in 30 countries, and uh, this is where we can help through our team to access those markets. Uh, some, at some places, we are like deeply involved in, in the market, somewhere less uh, involved, but we all are very much committed to help you enter all of those markets. But it's not limited with that. We have about 1,500 uh, members of the community, founders from different countries, that means you already have global access uh, to um, uh, most of the countries uh, around the world. And uh, the more uh, entrepreneurs you bring to our network, the stronger our network will be. So uh, all those people are willing to help and it's all at no cost. But it's not limited with that. Uh, we recently have built uh, Telegram bots uh, for you to connect and build your international network out of our community. So 
once you register on this Telegram bot, uh, it's very simple. The system will automatically offer you one person out of our global network uh, to introduce you, uh, each other and use, you, this is how you can meet other founders from different countries and uh, you don't have to even um, do anything. The system will automatically offer you and if you would like to meet, you will write each other and you will expand your international network. This is pretty cool. I have got lots of uh, positive feedback and it's working well. Uh, another perk we have for you is this cool stickers that, that were created by our team of leaders and amazing people just so that are so inspired about our community. Um, so these are free stickers you can use uh, on our chats and in your uh, messengers like uh, Telegram or WhatsApp. And uh, if you like it, just take it. It's free. Enjoy it. As you know, it's important for us uh, that you have uh, expertise of how to start global companies. And this is why we bring speakers like Kate today and other global speakers to share expertise and knowledge with you so you can build your international companies. And we already have about 60 webinars for, uh, for the past six, uh, seven months. And um, those speakers we invited are very well selected and uh, interviewed in advance. So. Those are uh, Steve Hoffman, Donna Griffith, uh, Elias Tribulayev, Bill Reichert, all those amazing uh, people came uh, to us to speak with you uh, on certain topics to give you more expertise. Uh, and so you can move on to the next step. Our upcoming webinars, we have lots of great uh, speakers to help you on certain topics. Uh, recently, uh, next week, actually, mm -hmm. we will have um, uh, ex-vice president from Alibaba Group from China. He will be speaking about China's uh, opportunity for starting businesses and expanding into China, uh, especially online business like e-commerce and uh, some uh, and related topics uh, to that. Use this opportunity because uh, this is a rare opportunity to speak to people of that with that expertise. It's a those events already announced and published, so you can find them on our Eventbrite page or Facebook page. Just make sure to register in advance. Uh, we are partnered with Australian government and Australian uh, Innovation Hub in Queensland, Australia. And we will talk about opportunities in Australia, how to enter Australian market for international entrepreneurs and uh, all those people from uh, local business and uh, uh, Australian government will join us to speak with you and uh, clarify those questions uh, so you can expand your business into Australia as well. Uh, there will be a, a webinar in Russian for Russian speaking audience, how to enter international markets if you started in Russia or CIS region. So the CEO of Capacity who has a company in San Francisco will share his story and you can uh, discuss uh, with him your story so entrepreneur to entrepreneur can help and expand right uh, there is another awesome webinar that is about to be uh, th that will be in december or in russian i also plan to do this in english with one of the top managers of uh, techno uh, the Mos moscow school of management skolkova uh, he used to be a top manager in there but uh, max feldman he, He's a very experienced in terms of building network, business network, and he will be sharing with you how to build this net, uh, your business network uh, locally, globally for your business, for your uh, personal life and so on. It's amazing uh, speaker, so make sure to not to miss this uh, webinar. Uh, the, the one in English will be uh, announced later. Every uh, month we have monthly founders meetups. There, there is one in Russian that will be end, the, the last Friday of uh, November and also there will be the last Friday of December. So me, make sure if you speak Russian, make sure to join this webinar. It's announced on our um, webinar and Facebook page. Those who uh, speak Russian and need support in uh, uh, with their pitch, uh, we have once a month a pitch test event so you pitch and uh, Sergey and Vyacheslav are giving you feedback the same one we're going to do 
uh, in English soon, uh, follow our announce announcements. And um, um, uh, we do have monthly meetups for, for global founders around the world. Every first Friday of the month, we have a webinar in English for founders from different countries. Uh, uh, recently, we had founders from South Africa, US, Canada, Nepal, France, Russia, Singapore. So it's like crazy. It's a really global network and uh, people, entrepreneurs are just after five minutes, they find common ground and starting helping each other. And the other event, uh, I don't like, have a slide here yet, but I will have soon a slide. We are launching an initiative with 500 startups and we're gonna do a series of webinars uh, with 500 startups alumni and they will be sharing their expertise on how they started their company and managed to uh, grow them so successfully. And you'll be able to ask their questions and maybe have some discussion. Um, if you like our webinars, if you'd like to join, just very simple, uh, find us on Facebook uh, 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 and on Facebook Go Global World, and there you can find the section events and you can register or just follow this QR code uh, on Eventbrite uh, and you'll see our events or, or in Eventbrite you just can find Go Global World. And that's it. Our partners, uh, we have lots of amazing partners from around the world. In Russia, we have Technopark Skolkova, Axis Innovations in Israel, Rus Base in Russia, Mind Hive in Australia, Moscow School of Management Skolkova, uh, High School of Economics in Russia, IB Consultor in the United States, IT Park in Uzbekistan, Adventure Land in Russia, Collaborativa in Mexico, Expert Dojo in Los Angeles, Startup News in India. EOS Entrepreneurship in Uzbekistan and Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Florida and many more. Those organizations are committed to help you to, ex, uh, to enter their markets. So you, if you need any support from them, you can just go on our website and find their uh, contacts in there. Just follow their, the link to their website and you'll be able to connect with them or we can introduce you directly if you need to. Uh, if you have any questions to ask, you have suggestions, you would like to uh, uh, become a leader or you would like to uh, recommend anybody to become a leader or participate in our organization deeply, just uh, email us uh, your ideas, information, and we'll be happy to speak with you. If you, have, if you would like to join our community, become a member um, and actively participate, just follow our website go global world and uh, uh, there you'll find instructions how to uh, join our social networks uh, and you just need to be on our facebook link uh, linkedin and telegram groups and then you will be able to communicate with our network globally on this note i have finished uh, my part and i'm passing the word to kate cohen uh, kate hi how are you Hi, Daniel. Thanks for, thanks for such an impressive presentation on everything that you guys are doing. I think it's a lot of great content and great materials actually for, for startup community globally. Um, very impressive, you know, to be honest with uh, everyone. Thank you very much. Doing. Yeah, we are, we, are, we are doing our best. Uh, we have amazing people supporting us globally. So yeah, I appreciate it. Well, it's super important to find like like-minded people who are eager to do, you know, to jump into the same vision and help you build and scale. On that note, <laughs> so thanks for having me. Uh, I'm happy to share with you guys some wisdom <laughs> related to alternative capital and actually what other options are there on the market for startups, for growth, st growth stage startups. What are the options for you to, to grow, not the traditional way, uh, way just to tap into uh, and scout for VC money. Um, let me share like a small presentation that I prepped for you guys. Um, can you see the screen? All good? Yeah. So I guess like uh, before I jump into this, a quick uh, intro about myself in the past, oh my God, about five, six years, I've been investing um, as a, in the venture space and early stage, um, Companies. Let me move this. Hold on. Yes. 
second. Early stage companies across different verticals within startup ventures, uh, which we build an accelerator here in New York City. Um, I personally invested in 106 companies, got four exits, um, and lived through the whole cycle uh, of investing, helping companies grow, uh, grow and help them get to exit and uh, see their returns of their ventures. Prior to that, I built my own startup, which I did sell in 2015. That actually brought me to the dark side of the world, as I call it, venture capital. Um, in parallel, I started investing as an angel investor into actually consumer companies, US-based. Uh, within Starter, just to go back, within Starter, we've been investing in immigrant founders. We have uh, lots of Russian, European, Latin America, all over the world kind of founders that we um, invested and helped them grow, expand to US market. But again, as an angel, I've been focusing purely on US companies um, and consumer. So I have lots of passion to consumer sector, uh, just because that's something that affects us, the regular humans on day to day, and you can see the impact right away. Um, and as I invested as an angel in consumer companies, I saw a clear need um, for this type of companies in terms of uh, variety of capital, because a traditional venture capital, um, you know, and giving up equity to grow your company and pump into marketing, user acquisition would be too expensive. So I started looking specifically for my portfolio companies, what are the options out there? How can we bring additional capital to help grow, but not use the equity money to fuel that growth? Because it doesn't make sense to give up a portion of your company to finance your marketing and ad campaigns. Um, with that, um, I saw that there are actually not that many players on the market uh, you know, who's simply financing startups. The banks wouldn't do that. Of course, there are hard money lenders, but they would ask like your personal assets and all that. So it would be pretty much the same as you going and taking a bank loan. Why bother putting your company name on it? Um, and there, of course, there are some funds that would provide venture debt, but again, they would piggyback on the around that you raised prior to that. So seeing that uh, what's happening on the market you know, I saw an opportunity that this sector of venture debt would be actually growing. And by venture debt, I mean also part of it as the revenue-based finance. I saw that the sector will be definitely growing and I'll explain more within a few slides that I'll be showing. Um, and then basically uh, last year, um, I left as a managing partner, started ventures and I launched the new strategy within certain ventures uh, which is purely focusing on venture debt, revenue-based finance for consumer companies, B2B, B2B2C, everything that ends with the, with the consumer at the end. Uh, within that strategy, we raised, um, we raised a fund and we started investing. We already have 10 companies in our portfolio. Uh, we validated the model and started pretty much scaling, financing um, and providing capital alternative capital to consumer companies um, uh, in the US. So, you know, um, and Daniel, please feel free to interrupt me, ask questions anywhere along, uh, or we can, you know, get any questions from the audience. Uh, but, sure. you know, to ask, um, like, what is, what is that venture that, what is revenue-based finance? What's the difference between the two? Uh, who's a good fit for that? So, um, you know, as I transition from what is 13, why are we doing that? Again, there are not that many players who are providing alternative capital. Who is a good uh, fit for revenue-based finance? Usually it's subscription companies, online retailers, D2C brands, any SaaS solutions as well um, that have like clear monetization and clear unit economics. Uh, within us, within Certain Ventures, we have two types of products. We're providing growth capital, uh, which is we can provide venture debt, we can provide revenue-based finance, and also we provide working capital. Let's say if a company has any purchase order from a big retailer, let's say if it's a brand who is selling not only online, but also selling offline in retail, and let's say they have a big purchase order from Whole Foods or any other guys, 
uh, and they might not necessarily have all the cash to finance that growth uh, will provide the capital just for exact purchase order. So within the, like, where do we see the certain ventures in the landscape? Um, there are like, again, if we're looking on the, who is the, who is the capital provider for startups or early stage company, right? Their friends and family, of course, their VCs and other platforms. Um, there are different uh, players. They're not that many, as I said, Lighter Capital has been historically the most known to provide venture debt to SaaS businesses. There is Clear Bank that is focusing purely on e-commerce. Circle Up is focusing on um, con consumer companies as well. And Bravo, we're great friends with them. They're focusing on mobile verticals, so providing revenue-based finance and um, and that capital to mobile-related um, like mobile apps. Within 13, we're blending the two. So we, we do have e-commerce, we do have uh, consumer companies. We are blending revenue-based finance, as I mentioned, and venture debt, but also we make exceptions and we do also equity finance. So what is venture debt, as I mentioned, right? Uh, typically venture debt is the term that's used to describe any lending done to a venture-backed uh, company. Um, if you look at the market, VC investments are about 84 billion and venture debt only takes like 10% of the market. And again, historically that been like, let's say average five to 10%. Now in the past year, it already increased to almost 15%. Um, venture debt, um, you know, the deals may vary, but uh, they're very unique terms for the company to tap into venture debt. And, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, so historically, again, venture debt um, is something common, let's say, if a company raises uh, Series A round and they take a portion of that round from some VC funds, and then venture debt would be the add-on to that round. Typically, historically, that's been provided by players like Silicon Valley Bank because, again, they're piggybacking on the VC funds, on their due diligence, and making sure that the company has enough cash to repay their venture debt. Um, so what is basically the venture debt is great to use if you already raised the round, so that's additional add-on. That means that if you, let's say, need 10 million to finance your uh, further growth, out of 10 million, you might have uh, 6 million as an equity round and 4 million, let's say, as a venture debt. Um, then, but again, with the venture debt, uh, SVB would take, um, you know, seniority on the debt. But again, that debt means that you can repay that and you will keep your com company equity secure. Venture debt is also great between the rounds. So let's say if the company needs an extended runway, then they can bring additional breach in the form of venture debt versus going in the market and raising that, that cash from VCs. So there are different types of venture debt. And the reason here I wanted to, uh, to visually like diversify the traditional venture lending and revenue-based finance, because revenue-based finance might not necessarily be like add-on add to the equity round that could be used between the rounds. Um, so traditional venture lending, you know, it's a debt that typically would be, let's say, 30% of the round that you're raising. You would repay that back within three, four years. Um, their asset back financing is available. I'm sure you guys all know that. Revenue-based finance is a model where you get the money at a multiple, but the way you repay that is quite unique. You pay it with a percentage from your revenue over the course of, let's say, three to five years. So the revenue-based finance gives you a flexibility that you don't have to pay exact like monthly installments, but you, if you grow and once you grow, you, you typically you wouldn't pay more than 10% from your revenue. So you start paying that uh, percentage from your revenue towards uh, that debt. So let's say if you have a hockey stick, right? Then you repay that debt you know, in two years. If you have a slower growth, it will take you longer. But again, there are no, for the company, it wouldn't be an additional stress to, to have like a certain amount of installments that you have to repay. Um, as I mentioned, uh, types of the venture debt 
we discussed a little bit there again there are so many benefits um to let's say uh revenue-based finance and venture debt versus the traditional equity so um as i said there is a multiple uh like is multiple you're paying back. The biggest thing is the the the, the founder doesn't have to give up give up equity, so uh, he keeps the ownership. Um, you don't have to put any collateral, um, and uh, yeah, it's quite flexible. Plus, um, you know, you can't. I mean, for your company finance, that could sit on your that can give you some tax deduction. So there are some perks in that. And I think this slides gives you like an overview of like revenue-based finance, venture debt and venture capital. Uh, again, first main differentiations, duration, right? Uh, revenue-based finance is flexible. You can start repaying from six to, you know, in the course from six to three years, venture debt three to five years, um, VC capital is usually five plus. Um, debt payments, percentage, uh, venture debt has fixed interest, uh, equity ownership. With revenue-based finance, you don't have direct ownership, same as venture debt. Venture capital, you do have direct ownership. Um, for the uh, repayments, future monthly revenues, uh, with venture debt, you, the typical like lender would take warrants and take the interest on that, while venture capital would all know. Um, pretty much the, the rest I already mentioned. So who are, let's say, um, those type of capital providers on the market? That could be bank, like Silicon Valley bank type of guys, BC, there are a bunch of different funds out there in US and globally. And there are players like alternative capital providers like 13 Ventures. Um, and again, there are different terms. So if, if we'll take a traditional banking um, the challenge in US, and I know in, in Europe, that might not be the same challenge, European banks, and also European, they have like lots of grants and banks are a little bit more flexible, but US banks wouldn't typically finance uh, a startup at the growth stage. There are too many risks and the bank just simply wouldn't know how to assess those risks and how to score this type of company. Um, so uh, banking, uh, venture capital uh, and alternative guys like us. Within the landscape, um, as I mentioned, there are different players. Uh, all of them have different loan sites. They can provide different loans, different uh, terms. I encourage you guys to do additional research on all those players um, and find out their um, terms. And then we can go deeper on examples, but before jumping into that, you know, I'll be happy to actually answer any questions and we can open to Q&A and within that Q&A, uh, I can provide additional light on how would that uh, look like or any typical um, that structure that could be. Uh, Nikita is asking, where uh, do you take, would you take your first money for VC13? Sorry, say again, what's the the question is asking where to take first money uh, for venture capital 13. Uh, it's a kind of strange question. Um, Let me open the question. Where you take your first money. So uh, great question. Basically, the way we structured, uh, we have different capital providers to us um, as 13 ventures. So we function as a as a fund. Right, we have family offices, mostly actually European and US family offices. Um, also, we do have like actually a hedge fund, US hedge fund, who provides us the credit line, but the hedge fund uh, wouldn't work with startups, right? So we act as originator and uh, we leverage that credit line to provide the capital to other startups. That's typically how most of like Clider Capital, Clear Bank, and other guys similar to us work. They have a, a credit a credit, a credit line who simply don't work with the with startups market. And guys like us know how to score, how to like we have the experience working with startups. So we know how to score, we know how to underwrite and how to assess the deal uh, from that perspective. 
Another question from Nikita. Uh, which stage, uh, which stage of a startup can uh, can you hear me, Kate? Hello. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, again, yeah, Nikita is asking uh, which stage of startups can find partners or investment faster on a global market. Can you give some examples for best way for capitalization and for sales? Which stage of startups? Um... Well, look, um, so let's say if you are, let me bring into different stages. Let's say if you're early stage startup and you're finding your go to market strategy on like, let's say in US or any other market, most of the work it's better to do like either yourself, right? You do lots of reach outs at campaigns and test drive. You can leverage partners, local partners who know the market really well and can you can help you do that. Um, in fact, you know, we've been helping a lot of European companies to scale in US just because we have that experience. However, let's say if you're a startup um, at the early growth stage, you already have the revenue. Uh, let's say you are based in Europe, you already have the revenue in Europe. Um, it might be easier but also could be challenging for you to enter the new market because you might think that the same model might work in us but in reality it might not work at all right so you still need to do that validation you still need to test the market however if you have the revenue yourself you do have some cash to test drive that that's a little bit of a different story so let's say from investor perspective if you are based outside of us and you still want to tap into you know, US market and you need to raise for that, uh, for that <laughs> expansion, most of let's say US funds wouldn't finance it because you still need to show them traction, you, know, you need to show them some validation. Most of the cases it's easier to actually go to your local community and local funds to raise from them uh, for that expansion, right? Because for them, it will be additional value. Um, that would be, I think, my advice. I'm not sure if that was exactly the question uh, on okay. the on the finding the the partners and investors. Daniel, what do you think about that question? I think it's a good question. I, I mean, um, fair answer. But uh, Nikit, if you want uh, some clarification, just write down additional questions. Uh, no problem. We can uh, give you uh, additional uh, clarifications. Uh, next question, uh, and we can move on, um, from Keith Newman. Uh, he's okay. asking, um, how long has 13 Ventures uh, been around? Typical check size, number of deals you make per year? Yep, great question. So we started the strategy last year um, in August. Um, we typically have the check somewhere from 250 to 1 million. And we make those tranches in, uh, so we basically let's say we'll commit 1 million to the deal, but we'll make uh, like tranches because again, we're financing the growth. So we've, let's say the first tranche we make 350K and within three months, the company is still not growing using this capital because this capital goes purely to user acquisition and marketing and growth and not reaching the certain next milestones, we'll need to understand what is happening with the, with the company. Is Are these funds using accordingly? Um, but yeah, that's typically the range from 250, 350 to 1 million. Again, historically, uh, we're comfortable to provide 30% uh, of the capital, 30% uh, of the company's annual revenue, right? So let's say if the company is generating 5 million a year, then we'll be comfortable giving 30% out of that 5 million to fuel the growth. Um, and traditionally that's similar to other players on the market, similar to 13, I would say. Since you, you mean mentioned- That would do 30%. Yeah, since you mentioned uh, some details about your fund, then uh, please specify what kind of industries you're looking for. Uh, so uh, people would be able to uh, address. Right, so as, a, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we look at everything that has clear unit economics. So e-commerce, uh, any SaaS business, right? Um, anything that has the consumer at the end. 
Uh, we closed, for example, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, SaaS company, they're doing digital check-ins for health clinics, right? So even though they're making B2B sales, they're also having B2B2C uh, model within the company. Um, so typically, uh, yeah, everything that has clear unit economics and scalability, we wouldn't finance, um, I don't know, um, drones that might not be selling, right? And we would, again, for us, the company has to be at the stage where they're generating revenues. So the early stage growth, the revenue could start somewhere from 10,000 a month um, and up to whatever. We, we're quite comfortable, even if they're making 10 million a year. Awesome. Uh, we have a few more questions, but uh, would you like to move on uh, to, to the next part of your presentation? I think I'm pretty much um, Are you done. done. Or... Like, yes, I think um, the two, I had two slides on examples how that would work. Uh, but I think we, we pretty much discussed them as well. Awesome. Yep. Um, all right, Kate, okay, thank, uh, thanks for feedback. Uh, he enjoyed your answer. Um, we have uh, um, some more questions. Uh, I'm asking everyone to uh, please write down your questions while Kate is uh, on the line with us. And uh, those who want uh, to ask the question verbally, just raise your hand in the, here in the chat and um, uh, we'll give you a chance to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, Anastasia Moroz is asking, VCs usually provide smart money with network mentoring and so in uh, return of shares. What do you offer extra to the loan? I think in terms of the loan VC is not that interesting in helping a startup to grow. Hmm. Well, it's interesting. You know, um, the interesting part is you as the founder um, really need to assess um, what do you want out of building your company and like, how would that success look like, I don't know, eight years later and that exit look like, right? So if you have a VC investing in your company, that's additional boss that you have on your cap table who will tell you where you should be in eight years, regardless whether you want to be there or not. That extra boss will be on your board and will tell you, look, um, hold on, what was the name? Uh, Anastasia or Noah, Maria, I forgot the name who the lady will ask Anastasia. the question, right? Like, nice. So. <laughs> Anastasia, you need to, we need exit. Like, you, we need to make multiple on our cash, right? And Anastasia say, well, guys, I have a different idea for, the, for my exit. I don't want to, to sell my business. I'm, I'm, I want to do IPO. And they would say, you know what? We're sorry, but our fund is done with investment. We need returns. We need to raise another fund. So you need to show us an exit. But with that said, like any founder should think on, on how would, like, what would the health look like for their cap table? How would that success look like for their company? If you're saying that you're bringing the VC money to fuel that your growth, so you're saying you using that cash to acquire users and pump and test your advertising, then you are giving up a portion of your equity for that test drive, which at the end of the day would be very expensive, especially eight years later. But if you're coming to, let's say, other capital providers, they're not going to sit, your, sit on your uh, cap table. They have different returns and different motivations. For them, it's okay to have you know, interest, repayment, they already see that you're quiet users, you have some revenue, you prove the model and they know that with the additional cash, you can, you know, you pump that cash into more advertising and user acquisition and marketing and you pump your revenue to, I don't know, you double, you triple, but you can also repay higher multiple on, on that money provided. You know, most, uh, I, would, I would be honest, like most of the capital providers, alternative capital providers, they wouldn't give you additional value or additional help that the VCs would give. Of course, like if you bring VCs, they bring you network, they help you with additional perks. Mo most of alternative capital providers wouldn't do that. We have within us, we have um, additional perks and value that we do give 
uh, we built our own technology, which is called VentureBox. So we assess all the company vitals, um, like all their Shopify accounts, banking, all their revenue streams, and we provide additional data insights. Um, and basically, there are not that many, I would say there are no tools out there for the founders that will help them assess their financial health from revenue perspective and you know profits and returns with the analytics that we provide to the company. So that's the value we do give. Um, again, we do also provide more financial advisory, uh, but we're not providing that to every company. Most of the portfolio companies, we do give that. Awesome. Um, there is a question from Parmit. Uh, would you be in, uh, interested investing in Middle East Dubai startups? I wish not yet. Um, again, as long as maybe the company is incorporated in US, uh, yes. Um, we, we didn't have any deals from Middle East yet. Uh, we had a bunch of European deals that they have. Um, actually, one of the deals we're closing right now, they're based in Spain. All their R&D is in Spain. However, they have US uh, holding company uh, where Spanish is a subsidiary and the main revenue goes to the US uh, entity. We are only working with um, uh, US jurisdiction right now. Uh, hopefully we'll expand to new markets next year. You never know. Right. Um, so uh, in terms of basic uh, uh, um, things for startups, when uh, uh, most of the investors invest, uh, like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, they, uh, uh, they need to be uh, um, structured in um, Delaware, uh, uh, wherever they are, and they also need to have their IPs. What else uh, uh, they need to have? So it's like to meet basic requirements so they get interested with uh, by, by US investors. Again, it depends which market you target. Most of US investors, for them, of course, like Delaware, um, Delaware setup is the crucial one. Uh, but if you're targeting your own market investors, they don't really care. So um, Delaware set up, what else? If you have quite transparency, how you structure it, if you have other, let's say you are indeed in Europe or Middle East, as long as it's clearly legally structured, that's not a problem as well. Yeah, and in terms of traction, uh, uh, if you have traction outside the United States, is it... Uh, is it a big deal uh, for investors that, that they don't have a revenue in the United States? Um, I think it is because again, you, you need to show that revenue stream. Again, if you're targeting alternative capital providers, right? Because they also need to show your, like you need to see historicals, right? So you'll pull all your historical numbers and revenues from the past 18 months. Um, it would be harder to assess outside of US um, you know, transactions. So alternative capital providers, if they're in US and they're investing only in US entities, for them, that would be important. If that's VC money, that could be flexible uh, depending on the fund. Uh, but again, from my experience, most of VC funds, they're still like, okay, show me the same traction in US, whatever you did mm -hmm. in your own market, you know, forget about it. We don't even count that. Um, that's from my experience. Daniel, I know you also had lots of companies that went through you. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, we have good examples uh, in uh, Belarus and uh, in uh, Israel. So those mm -hmm. countries are like focusing right, uh, uh, right away on the global market. And so they don't really look for opportunities in their local market in terms of expanding their solution. And uh, that helps them to actually build the product uh, and have traction in, in the United States. And later on, they have also traction in their local country. But this is how they get uh, uh, noticed by top VCs, uh, top funds, and accelerate their growth fast. Uh, I think one of the, in my opinion, uh, crucial, uh, most important steps are to be incorporated in the United States in terms of uh, if you want to get uh, uh, funding from U.S. investors, you got to get uh, IP, uh, move your IPs into your U.S. Uh, entity 
and you got to get uh, traction uh, in the states. So those like fundamental things have to be there. And of course, you got to build a relationship uh, in advance with investors. They don't really want to speak with, I mean, they know, it's, it's hard to get them uh, excited about you, about your company right away. You got to build relationships. So it just take time. Take time. What do you think about that? Yeah, 100% agree. Mm -hmm. I also started reading additional questions, great questions. Yeah, so there is an anonymous question uh, from uh, uh, from uh, uh, our, our member. Uh, what are the options for pre-revenue company who needs uh, to raise capital to build the MVP when uh, there is a significant cost involved? That's like actually a very popular question. Yeah, great question. I think uh, uh, three answers. One, <laughs> of course, friends, three Fs. Yeah. right the the friends family and and fools the second one would be uh most likely angels you know angel investors uh within your community who have certain passion for what you're building um that could be again angels you know they might not be professional angels or so professional or not professional angels that's a different category um, the third would be actually lots of accelerators and also like, uh, you know, other hubs, incubators that do provide the pre-seed money to help you to help you build the MVP. I mean, there are even some studios that um, help you build the product just for equity, right? So that's an option as well. Once you figure out that early stage, um, I mean, pre-seed, get the money, build your product you have a different stage that now you need to actually gain traction for what you built. Um, that's another challenge. So it's like building from zero to one and from one to further. So our, our fund is good when you already have one and you're already scaling and you already have revenue and you need to keep growing. So that's where we sit. However, with my previous fund, we've been investing in lots of, you know, free seed companies actually uh, helping with MVPs and um, validating the products. That would be my answer. Daniel, you also have a huge background on that. Um, yeah, uh, let me uh, let me see. Um, I, I I think it, the answer is perfect. Uh, if, uh, accelerators, uh, three Fs. I agree. Uh, um, you know, on the first stage, in my opinion, uh, most successful entrepreneurs, they uh, need to find ways to uh, microfinance uh, either themselves or from uh, um, grant money or maybe get support from accelerators. You mentioned sometimes techno parks support them. There are local uh, uh, grants that might uh, help them. So there are incubators that give a little bit of cash uh, so they can build their first MVP. Um, there is some uh, uh, ecosystem. Uh, uh, there, there is uh, some uh, ecosystem that exists uh, to support early stage companies. You just need to sell uh, your vision, your company, your skills uh, to that organization, to those organizations. So they may, might support you. But definitely, those first steps are most difficult ones. You need to get from this point. To your first sales that's uh that is a very hard option and that that is a way where entrepreneurs get very creative there is no one answer to that but those uh options that kate said and i just mentioned uh might be uh among many options startup may find um you need to be on the network with startups and uh, communities like ours uh, and we are not, uh, I mean, the world is not limited with us. There are lots of uh, startup communities. Uh, so by building network, you pro probably can get uh, some additional insights, inspirations, uh, how to get your first funding of, for your MVP. But uh, there are basic ones, the mo most obvious ones, like accelerators, incubators, um, support from uh, techno parks, uh, grant money, and something like that. We actually forgot one more, like crowdfunding platforms. Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's actually a pretty good one if you have some experience uh, or expertise in crowdfunding campaigns. 
then yeah, uh, might be a good financing options. What would be your recommendation for uh, crowdfunding campaigns if, if people would decide to do? Uh, you know, I mean, depends how like what are you building because there are like Indiegogos, there are um, what's their Kickstarters. Uh, now there is also Republic. There are a couple crowdfunding uh, platforms out there, and I think all of them they have their different specialities. Um, you know, let's say if you're building some hardware device and um, Indiegogo might be a good one mm -hmm. to raise money for your MVP from the crowd. And that actually also helps you to validate your idea, right? Like if you want to build another smartwatch, um, then you can test, test that and see if the crowd would actually buy that, right? So technically they're paying for your future product and that's how you get your money to build that MVP. If let's say, I don't know, you um, you have a SaaS solution that might not be the good one for you, uh, but I would I would suggest exploring those platforms um, to see if that, that could work. The biggest upside, again, that gives you such a huge validation. So you don't need to build something that people will end up not really uh, be interested to buy later on, right? So imagine you, you brought some angels, I don't know, you, you raised 200K from local, I don't know, from France, he used that to build a new smartwatch, but then you cannot really sell it. Nobody's interested to buy, right? So the biggest upside on that additional validation that you get, um, and again, like lots of platforms, you can also uh, check those out um, and see that could be a good fit. Yeah, I agree. I would just add that um, uh, if you go on uh, uh, on that path, so raising from like uh, crowdfunding campaigns, just make sure that you compete with thousands of other entrepreneurs. And uh, uh, the rules here are a little bit different. So you need to make like a super uh, concise and inspiring video that is emotional and make it so obvious that this technology has to exist then it will actually accelerate your funding. Sometimes there are excellent solutions, but they make crappy video. And this is about, uh, this crowdfunding campaign, uh, campaigns are about impression. And uh, so good products sometimes cannot raise uh, money just because they didn't do proper marketing. And this is all about how you present yourself and how you demonstrate your solution on the video. And sometimes uh, there are this, crazy funding campaigns like uh, a guy I know uh, raised two hundred thousand dollars for just t-shirts you know like he sprayed t-shirts with some like he called technology and people like but he made amazing video about that mm -hmm. and people loved it and they invested in that I mean but it's just it's so crazy <laughs> just a video apart is super important uh, yeah uh, I think yeah go, go ahead crowdfunding is all about marketing you're right it's like you know and you need to keep in mind that you need to invest in that marketing before you can actually raise anything yeah and i spoke with some experts from crowdfunding if uh, we just finish this part of the topic uh, they say like don't hesitate to invest in video if you're outside us you probably might need to invest about a thousand bucks if you're in the us a good uh, uh, good video editing uh, com uh, companies would be budgeting at about 10k so you would have to still invest i agree with k yeah. and what are you, what are your thoughts about um, um grant money like uh, those kind of things you know sometimes a different organization or even yeah. people uh, are giving uh, for some calls uh, or s some support from the government even those grant money I think that's great to take that. <laughs> well, the thing is, we don't have that many grants in US, as you know. Yeah. Um, I feel like um, European startups have that luxury of European grants. And that's quite, from what I see, quite realistic to get. Um, and again, the, the ecosystem, startup ecosystem is not that well developed elsewhere. So they're not, they're, there are not that many grants happening in Latin America, um, Ukraine, Belarus, Russia. Not really. I mean, there, there are some organizations. Von Bortnika, if you talk about Russia, Von Bortnika, the founder of Bortniks. 
do they still give grants um as far as i'm aware i'm not sure uh, i remember they used to like but again i'm um you know i don't know what's the caveat of of those grants i think then you have lots of also there's a downside then right like it has to be certain jurisdiction then you are sort of also limited how can you grow on other markets and if you need like a us entity how would that work with um, with that governmental entity that gave you grants now i know specific cases with the european startups like their french grants and uh, some other uh, european union companies they don't have those limitations and restrictions let's say if you're expanding to us but that might not be again that, that that might not be the case for other government if it's a government grant right if it's some other nonprofit sure there might be more flexibility but i always encourage to think like uh, make sure you i would say fast forward a couple years right like would this grants or money be actually toxic for you or not is there maybe what what would be your options right like mm -hmm. always think through the end not like at the current moment like i understand you might need that cash in the moment but if two years from now because of that 100k 50k you will be so limited to raise like us uh vc money then mm -hmm. and if you have no options to repay them back okay what what was the good thing you got it you know so I, I again i always encourage to think through the end and when you discuss the terms of those grants and you sign up for that so yeah actually what are your actually, thoughts i think like you, you have more somewhere. yeah i think uh, um, um, sometimes startups can negotiate uh, with uh, uh, grant providers and uh, mm -hmm. uh, I know some cases like with Fond uh, Fund of Bortniks. Uh, he, they, uh, some startups negotiated where the IP should be, where the company has to be incorporated, and there are there were some um, um, kind of uh, negotiated options so they could raise VC money as well. So you just need to negotiate sometimes. But it's not easy. I agree. You touched on a very uh, uh, interesting. Uh, you touched very interesting uh, part of this topic: uh, toxic money. Can you elaborate what is it uh, and um, uh, what are the examples without going into politics? Just and why they are uh, considered top toxic and what can uh, what harm can uh, what that can do to startups. You know, a toxic money might not be also relevant to government grants. It could be uh, related to, uh, you know, some, let's say, private investors here that you took the money early on. And again, it was very important that I mentioned, are those investors professional or not professional investors, right? Because if you're coming to a wealthy individual who made much, lots of his money or the wealth I don't know, on real estate, he has certain understanding on what kind of, um, on what kind of the returns he's expecting. And is in his view of the world, a startup is this kind of like um, a unicorn. Any startup would be associated with the unicorn. That would mean that he will make billions, millions and super fast. Well, unfortunately, the reality that doesn't happen super fast. So let's say in his imagination, two years from the, the moment that he gave you money, he thought you're going to be a billionaire unicorn IPO on uh, NASDAQ and uh, you are still pivoting and you're still trying to find your go to market strategy. Well, then there might be frustration from his side and the toxic part would be like coming to you and saying, Hey, Daniel, where is my cash, <laughs> right? And he, you would be like, what do you mean, where's your cash? Your cash is, a, is this is the equity I'm building the company. Uh, it takes time, right? And he has different expectations. I had cases where founders actually lost their companies because they had quite, um, you know, I wouldn't say toxic, but investors who had different expectations, right? And those relationships didn't end up anywhere good um 
and that's it. The company just had to close and, and nothing happened. So again, there, like, I wouldn't necessarily also call like governmental, uh, you know, there's so many, and of course you as a founder, you cannot project all kinds of different scenarios. Sometimes you just don't know what might end up being not the great thing that ever happened. Um, but that's, that's my take on the toxic. What that's are your great. thoughts? Yeah. I mean, good perspective. Very interesting answer. Um, uh, we have two questions that uh, people would like to ask verbally from Parmit and from Tara Kampes and uh, some questions in Q&A. Q uh, let, let's give a word to Parmit. Uh, Parmit, uh, please, uh, uh, please speak. Turn on your microphone. Hello, can you hear us? Parmit, you can ask your question. Hi, uh, sorry, I think I made it by mistake. I asked my question earlier already. All right. Was regarding the investment in the Middle East. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ah, All right. great. All right. Great. Tara, uh, it, you now can speak. Just a second. Zoom lets me do it. Just tried. I would be curious to hear. Uh, there are companies, there are now angel investors and uh, VCs who are investing in, uh, but we, we don't have any option of uh, venture debt. So that was something new for me, and uh, that's the reason I wanted to know more about it. Great. Well, that's interesting. Maybe maybe we should talk, <laughs> because I don't know the local landscape, so would be happy to explore further, to bring that strategy to the market. Uh, all right, Tara, just uh, don't want to raise uh, your uh, Tara, if you want to speak, uh, just raise your hand again because I don't see your hand. So probably you don't want to ask your question. Anyways, we have another question in Q&A section. And if you guys uh, want to speak verbally, ask a question verbally, just raise your hand. We will give you uh, an opportunity to ask Kate your question verbally. Uh, from uh, Alexander Kalinikov, what are typical conditions on convert convertible nodes? And from me, can you please compare uh, convertible nodes with SAFE and uh, from the other organizations like uh, 500 startups? So, uh... Sure. Um, so convertible nodes, it's, it's pretty much a form of debt that the company will take. Will take. The only difference is that convertible note, um, it has the, um, I would say, not the philosophy, but more of the... Um, uh, historically, the nature of and the goal of this convertible note to be converted at the round as the company raise, raise the round, right? So let's say if you need some bridge money, you'll take convertible note from investors, you cap certain parameters, um, and that's related to the question, what are the typical conditions in the convertible note? So you cap certain um parameters and you negotiate in that convertible note given that you will be raising the round and this convertible note will convert in the round and will basically convert into an equity uh, for this investor so well, that the typical conditions that could be the term uh, like the length of that convertible note um, well amount obviously certain uh, round uh, terms. So whether this investor will get a discount on the, on the term, or maybe this investor will cap certain valuation. So let's say uh, he will give you the money at, I don't know, 5 million valuation uh, cap, and then you end up uh, in raising uh, the money at like 10 million valuation that that investor has upside. Or if he has a discount, uh, that means he, he might get a discount with the valuation that you're raising that round. Um, the next terms would be more on the interest because again, the convertible note is a debt instrument. Uh, so you do have to, and again, as you negotiate with, uh, with investor, right? Every investor might have any preferable terms. Uh, we do convertible notes as well. However, we structure them very differently. So um, let's say you might have to pay the interest on the convertible note um, could vary somewhere from three to 7% a year. Um, that's again, how you negotiate. 
So now there is a second type of convertible notes, those notes that are, uh, you know, that have additional triggers or additional terms. So when we, at 13, we do, uh, we do structure convertible notes. However, since like our philosophy was like, look, we want to make sure uh, that the founders are motivated to raise additional capital, bring the capital to company to grow further, right? So it's not just you take the convertible note that has no expiration or that has no triggers that let's say if you plan to raise a uh, series A in 18 months, but you're sitting and actually not raising anything, nothing will happen to convertible note. It wouldn't even convert because there is no round. So the way we structure our convertible notes is let's say if 18 months from now, once we give you the money, you're actually not raising the, the next round, you have to repay and the repayment structure for this convertible note. That also motivates the founders like and and more like having there are two things right it does additional motivation to the founders to make sure that they raise the the the, the round that they planned uh, but also for the investors we don't want to have this zombies who have the notes and these notes are not converting and nothing is happening and your capital like also is not generating any returns for the investors because for investor to get, let's say, 3% a year on the money he's giving to within the convertible note, that's not an interesting, you know, uh, interest. You, you might just better you know, put in capital markets. Um, but so for us, uh, the additional terms with structure, like let's say repayment or certain triggers if things don't happen. Um, and that gives some kind of like discipline for the founders to not just sit on like, bunch of convertible notes. I don't know, you can keep bringing convertible notes um, and then not, not growing accordingly. Um, with that said, what is the difference between safe? And well, I'm not a big huh? Safe and keys. Uh, keys is by 500, 500 startups. If you're aware of it, if you're not, that's fine. Yes, um, I am. Um, I'm not a big fan, to be honest, of both of them. Um, I have a very unique cases where uh, upon exit, you know, the company had a bunch of keys and safes uh, and, you know, it didn't, it didn't really, it didn't convert in the right way for the cap table. Uh, and there was like lots of, um, there, there's still lots of arguments in the market, how investors or how VCs sees uh, those as like securities or not. Um, like <laughs> there's a lot to go into detail differences. I think like I'm not uh, a lawyer to provide those details, uh, but you know, those, to be honest, those could be great for, for uh, startups, for founders, because you're getting um, cash and uh, there are not that many terms associated with that. Right, especially with I don't know, safe. You don't have to pay interest. You know, there are no fixed terms. So as a founder, that could be a great solution for investors. Not so much, but there are certain clauses on those safes that might bite you on actually the rounds when you convert. So just be careful on the certain legal scenarios how that would play out later. But Daniel, what are your thoughts on on those three? Um, I think it depends on the investors from who you're trying to raise. Uh, you, you need to be prepared to, to be to go with uh, a convertible note or safe keys. Uh, just safe or keys, they are uh, easier for startup. It's easier to negotiate, and it's actually in terms of uh, uh, you know sales uh, sales wise and uh, uh, closing around. Uh, it's it's much faster. So when the investor is yep. like uh, interested, like let's say it, on the hook, <laughs> it's it's just very easy to sign. Just uh, I mean two fields to fill in, sign, and then you can use it to get your money uh, on your bank account. Uh, it's it's important as well because I mean there are some emotional part into this as well uh, when people cool down and. Mm, early stage investors might not be interested uh, as interested uh, later on. 
it helps to close the deal faster. But with convertible note, it's it's a little bit more negotiations, uh, though it it is more structured uh, document. So yeah, I with think more terms involved. Yeah, you're not really have, put. You... Yeah, it's great to have yeah. more uh, more tools for entrepreneurs, and sometimes those one type of tools uh, work uh, for them. Sometimes the other, but these are the options. I I'd, I'd prefer. Uh, as an early stage company, I would prefer, prefer to try first a safe, but many investors might not be happy with that. Exactly. So, I mean, again, for the founder, that could be great, <laughs> but for investors, like I wouldn't do saves right now. So, yeah. <laughs> sure. that's for sure. All right, uh, guys. It's like I we think... have no, no other questions. Um... Uh, there was one, uh, just one second. Yeah, there, there is one last question. Let, let's uh, wrap it up with the final question okay. from Nikita. Uh, and it's kind of basic question. Uh, uh, we already answered it some, at some point. So he says they have uh, many projects from talent, uh, from like lots of talents from university schools uh, for US market, but they don't have sales, for example, new agent, uh, engine for space rockets or uh, for your uh, uh, fund uh, it, it will be interesting uh, to invest after first sales I mean of course after first sales would be more interesting right and, and look guys I think uh, Nikit great question the the thing is I said you need to make sure that you're targeting the right investor uh, my fund personally, I mean, our strategy, we only invest in um, companies that have revenues and that have clear growth projection, right? Uh, however, there are a bunch of other funds, accelerators that invest in early stage when you don't have sales yet, um, they're making a bigger bet uh, and they also want a bigger portion of your company for that bigger bet. Right, so it uh, just make sure that you're targeting the right type and, and you do the research. Who, who are those investors who invest in space, space rockets? You know, like there's a bunch of them. I'm sure there's a list. You just need to do again the research and not approach like, uh, I don't know, a, a fund that only invests in uh, fintech with space startup. You know, you're just wasting your time unfortunately right so just make sure you do the research you you really scout the right uh, proper verticalized funds investors and you approach them uh, with your pitch perfect uh, and i can completely agree with you that's uh, uh that's probably among uh most common questions and uh, startups are unhappy that so many investors are not uh, interested in their solution and uh, it's very often people are not uh, targeting the right investors it's like sales like you know your target audience know who is investing in your area uh, if uh, investors invest in robots uh, un it's, it's unlikely he will invest in your SaaS solution or if you like in ad tech uh, and somebody is investing in rockets, it's probably not the right fit as well. So you find investors in your space and uh, mm, the, the easiest way and fastest way to do it, just uh, Google similar startups uh, in similar space, just uh, go on Crunchbase and just see the list of investors who invested in those companies. You already have some impression uh, who invested in similar uh, uh, companies or in this space and you can reach out to them already just go on web their websites you'll find uh, the forms to uh, reach out or their direct contacts or something like that um, there are two more questions do, do you want to take those two more questions or do you want to wrap it up I think we should wrap it up. Um, right. I see that the second question is re related to crash course about startup. Well, I think Daniel has a great community, so you can find lots of like-minded people and, and lots of events that Daniel is hosting. So, uh, you know, tune in into those and you'll be constantly building and learning. I'm sure there are lots of crash courses on startups. Uh, I don't know. Uh, there was some kind of 
venture academies or something. I mean, I don't even remember. Mm -hmm. There are, right, Daniel? Like, um, yeah, there are many, uh, many th ways uh, startups can learn how to re uh, build global companies in our community by just participating in our events. Uh, we have already 60 webinars uh, with global speakers like Kate. Uh, uh, and uh, there will be more the idea of these webinars is not to get more followers or become popular we don't care about that it's important that more people are watching it because we are not doing it uh, just for for only for us but what we want to achieve you guys we want you to uh, to go to the next step in your business and uh, that's why we bring uh, uh, the best speakers in certain fields uh, so you can directly speak with them like we, uh, we have uh, today's webinar. Um, on this note, uh, I would like uh, to give you, Kate, uh, the final words uh, to close our round, uh, to, to close our webinar. <laughs> uh, and uh, Great. I just uh, thank you very much for excellent uh, talk. Uh, I think this is super valuable for uh, entrepreneurs. And now we are uh, uh, this opened uh, some uh, maybe <clears throat> uh, unknown part for many startups who are trying to raise capital and they never think of uh, alternative uh, capital options. Uh, thanks for these qualifications. Thanks for, the, for your presentation. Uh, we would appreciate that if you would share your presentation on our global sure. chats, I'll share with you the links and feel free to uh, connect with our startups. We have many amazing global founders and probably some of them you in future be happy to invest uh, and uh, yeah uh, so your final words uh, for, for <laughs> well first of all thank you so much for for having me um you know i always uh since the launch of this strategy i love to educate the founders uh because i mean that's such a still such a new thing like this whole venture that revenue-based finance alternative capital uh, it used to be just like, okay, you're a startup, you go raise VC money, right? Like you just need the fund, which is still true depending on where you are at your stage of the company. If you're very early on, you do need VC, you do need um, angels, you do need all of that. My wisdom is like, look, always tap into, like always do research, always can, like, think and consider what are other options are there available just don't follow the typical path thinking that, okay, now I'm building this startup. All I need is this VC fund, VC money. You might just bootstrap, to be honest, you might get to certain revenue level and then you don't need VC. Maybe you'll find alternative guys like, like me who will help you take the company to the next level. But for you as a founder, that wouldn't be as expensive as giving up the equity of the company and having additional boss on your cap table. So my encouragement would be always do the additional research. Just don't follow the common path. Um, there are different capital providers, but also think that for your company growth, capital might not be the only thing that you need. You need so many other resources. Um, and of course, it's a pure luck that if you have that perfect blend of capital of like a great team and all of the things at the right moment, but just be patient, think that uh, might be that capital would not solve all your problems. Just be wide open, like open-minded and consider all options, not just like capital is a way, but what else that you might need. Um, that's my last piece of the encouragement. Um, that's it. Thank you so much for, for having me. And if you guys, yeah, if you have a company at the growth stage, if you're ready to figure out like your, your uh, you know, go-to-market strategy, you started generating revenues, you already see the path to, uh, to that hockey stick, right? Like feel free to reach out. Uh, I'll be happy to take a look um, at the company and see if we could be a good fit, if not, I'll be happy to refer to someone else um, in US in the market or I have a bunch of European connections as well to see who could be the right fit. Uh, please feel free to reach out. Um, that's, that's pretty much it.
and we excited to having you here as well. Thanks for uh, this topic. That was Kate Coin, uh, and uh, uh, a, a U.S. investor who shared with you uh, alternative options for uh, investing in startups. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you guys. And guys, have a, a great rest of the day. Goodbye. And weekend. Bye. Yeah, and Bye. weekend. Yeah.